and welcome to another very special episode of the Life of Die podcast, where once again we'll be discussing the Strong Team Dog Miniatures game published by Warlord Games. I'm absolutely thrilled to say that I'll be joined today by writer and lead designer on Strong Team Dog, Gav Thorpe. I first became aware of Gav through his work on a range of projects for Games Workshop, including Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000, Epic 40,000, and a game on which he was lead designer, Inquisitor. He's written countless articles for White Dwarf magazine and a number of books and novellas set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. And now with Warlord Games, he's created the Strong Team Dog Miniatures game, along with Andy Chambers, who also recently featured on our podcast. So it's a delight to have him here and to get the other side of the story about how Strong Team Dog came together. Hi, Gav. Welcome to Life of Die. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, you're welcome. I'm happy to come on and chat about uh, Strong Dog and stuff. Yeah, I'm delighted to talk more about it myself, as it's uh, one of my favourite games. So I think probably the best place to start would be to ask about your own background with the Galaxy's Greatest Comic. Can you remember your first prog? Yeah, well, it's interesting because I didn't I didn't actually start with a prog. I started with a best of. So best, it was like, I think it was monthly collections of older, older strips called Best of 2000 AD. And I remember that we were visiting my nan down in London, who lived just north of London. So it was obviously like holidays. And uh, on one of the days that we, we went out to the news agents and got to buy, buy a comic or a magazine sort of thing. And I picked up this Best of 2000 AD. And so I was just looking it up, which one? And I think it was number 13. Right. Best of 2000 AD 13. And I was like, as I was looking at like the page, it had them all. Um, and apparently that came out in October 86. So I would have been 12. <laughs> 12 years old, um, and as I figured October, it must have maybe been the October half term, I guess, um, that was on holiday <laughs> uh, down at my nan's. And then, again, looking through it, I, was like, I didn't recognise some of the contents of them. Um, so it's probably a little while before I bought some more. And then I, then I think for quite a while, I was looking at it, probably for about two years, I think I just bought the best ofs. Um, and I don't know if there's any overlap with the progs. I'm not quite sure which my first prog was. I've got them all in a box in the garage, but I can't get to them at the moment, so I couldn't go and check no, 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 <laughs> exactly which one it was was the first one. Um, so there was a bit of an overlap, I think. But yeah, a lot of my early thrill power came from the, the best of. And so I think, if I remember rightly, one of the first stories uh, in that one that caught me, and I read it and I was just like, wow, this isn't like anything, you know, this is not Beano or Dandy. <laughs> kind of territory that we're in anymore is it and it was an abc warriors strip which i think is called the cyboon something like that and so it's one of the old magnificent seven type strips where they're cleaning up mars and ranchers are picking on some native or semi-native martian creatures uh, which are kind of passive but they eventually the abc warriors get them to fight back and stuff but my first strontied dog well actually there was uh, i think it was like one or two issues in it. it was like the moses incident story yeah was uh, reprinted but the one i remember and actually I, I thought it was earlier than it was but the one i remember which was reprinted in best of 2008 was the killing yeah which was a, sort of like a very classic story kind of like you know um death match type thing that johnny and wolf are using to get bounties and stuff and i will get back to that later in the conversation i'm sure because that had a quite an impact on me that's the first story i remember reading of uh Stronty dog yeah, I mean, I think I think that was a great place to start, the best of 2000 AD, because I used to get them as well. I think I discovered that probably about three or four months after you did. Right, okay, yeah. It was uh, January 87 for me, uh, from memory. Right, yeah, okay, that's cool. So that's funny, but and I do remember uh, the Moses incident being republished in that. The thing that was ideal about that, of course, was that the best of 2000 AD tended to have the entire story, whereas obviously if you're buying the prog, it's like an episode each week, so you would it would be a while before you would actually get a whole story. So yes. to me, that's a great way to come into 2000 AD. Today. Yeah, absolutely. It was like the box set version, basically, wasn't it? You know, yeah. you could get all of, like I say, it was what might be like six or eight prog run in one go. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it, it was kind of curated as well. So it was it was the best generally. Some really good stories in there for the most part. Yeah, and I I, um, I was just having a look. I still got it. Obviously, had an effect on me because I've got the the nineteen eighty seven two thousand eighty annual. <laughs> so um, which would have been the, you know the, the following Christmas. I must have asked for that. We used to get an annual every year, and it like sort of to keep us quiet in the morning. Like between that opening our stockings, there'd be an annual, and we'd read that. Yeah. While my parents were still in bed, sort of thing, and, and uh, whatever. And so, obviously, that year, again, I don't know why, you know, like I say, it used to be Labino or whatever, but I had a, my first 2008 annual. And I picked up one somewhere, it must have been second hand or something like that, not 
for the, a 1979 annual. Right. She was uh, one not quite so careful owner. Uh, and it's interesting the difference in styles, even just between 79 and, and like 87. Hmm. Like that, you know, it's like the stories like Mac One, and uh, and it's, it feels a bit more boys' own kind of traditional comic in that kind of like late 70s, early 80s, and it kind of evolved into what I consider 2000 AD type stories, mm. much more futuristic kind of stuff, I suppose, by the time the mid 80s came around. So, so I've still got those tre- treasured possessions on the shelf, oh, along with like every prog and every best of. And I, I started reading, and I obviously I caught up on a lot of stuff with it because it was when Titan Books were doing like the what would be called trade paperbacks these days, I suppose. Again, doing the collected Judge Dread and Portrait of the Mutant and, you know, Rogue Trooper and all kinds of stuff. Again, all, all the nice big stories in one place or compilations of the stories. So I, I've got a fair few of those to, to kind of, I suppose, which kind of gave me a grounding and a lot of the stories that maybe had started a few years before I'd actually started reading. I'd kind of, I suppose, I, I still consider them part of myself, part of that time period when I started reading because those were the stories that were around, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of those collections as well. Back in the 80s, I've collected quite a few of the Titan books, which did the same thing, kind of collecting some of the famous storylines, like the Apocalypse War for Judge Dredd and Judge Child and things like that. And Yes, yeah, Judge, yeah, yeah, Judge Cal, you know, Day yeah, Lord died and all that sort of thing. Yeah, and then later on, they've obviously kind of reduced, they brought out all the kind of complete case files, and it's like you can really get everything now in that graph, you know, if you want it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've got a big chunky Judge Anderson that I've not actually got all the way through yet. I got for Christmas a few years ago, and I've not read all of them yet. But yeah, there's so much pages I've been around. It's been a long time, really, hasn't it? Let's be honest. So, <laughs> yeah, so, and yeah, it's just, I, I consider that, obviously, a lot of people know me for, like, Warhammer and Warhammer 40,000 stuff. It's essentially, the Games Workshop and 2000 D were the two main things in my, uh, like, teenage influences, I suppose. They were the things that were I was most into, I suppose. So it's kind of nice that the two two directions came together in one, being able to write, you know, a war game about 2000 AD. Because it's funny, but, you know, I, I, I would still love to work on those properties in some, some measure. You know, I got to do one set of teenage kind of fantasy dreams, as it were, and it's like the other is to work with, you know, Just Dread and Strongly Dog and Slain and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine it would be like a dream come true because I had very similar interests as yourself, you know, and uh, I think we're a similar age, <laughs> the two of us. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I can, Im- I can imagine that must have been really exciting for you. So one other question I was going to ask you just before we move on to the actual gaming side of things was what were your what were your favourite strips that you kind of gravitated towards when you were? Yeah, I mean, there wouldn't be anyone there that surprised anyone for that period, really. So, you know, it was Dread, Strontly Dog, Slain, ABC Warriors. And also, you know, I liked, uh, you know, I love Zenith, actually, you know, early Grant Morrison. Mm-hmm. Like, just, you can see him starting to play around with the ideas that he kind of start, was kind of famous for these days of, like, multiverse and all this kind of stuff. Had a very different take on superheroes. I think a very 80s British take on superheroes. And a slightly Alan Moore-esque as well. Kato Jones, again, more Alan Moore. DR and Quinch Alan Moore. Um, there's a bit of a theme there, <laughs> you know. Uh, and also, and some of the, again, a couple of things through the best of, a couple of the older strips, like the VCs. And, and obviously, again, being into, like, the war stories, obviously Rogue Trooper. And just, you know, some fabulous kind of, particularly Road Trooper, the stories were okay, but actually as much the world building, I think some really good stuff there, you know, so talking about things that you, you would want to kind of get involved with and kind of be able to explore in more detail. So, you know, it's like the Road Trooper was a great vehicle for this kind of just general kind of war is hell, future war type thing. Um, so, yeah, I really like that as well. And, and the various incarnations of the ABC Warriors down through the years as well. Yeah, and I always liked uh, Nemesis was was the other favourite of mine, which was linked to the ABC Warriors as well. Yeah, I think that, well the Nemesis because it's like Kevin O'Neill art was like really different and kind of very uh, again you know uh, Pat Mills quite you know the politics wasn't hidden. Yeah. You know, I think that had quite an influence on my outlook on life, probably as much as anything. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I know it's sort of crossover, like you say, with the ABC Warriors and the Chronicles of Chaos and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, but I, I like a lot of the design on Nemesis as well. And obviously, there's connections to the, the dystopia of one forty thousand and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, again, that's cool. And I, I once voted Blitzspear as my favourite spaceship, I think, in a, on a pole once, I think, because it just looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. I know. That's the thing. Once you start talking about it, there's just so many different storylines and strips in 2000 AD that really were great, still are. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So moving on then to the, the gaming side of things, which is the main focus of what we're talking about here. Obviously, Strontium Dog, how did that come about, I suppose, would be the... <laughs> <laughs> Would be the question. 
Well, it was really straightforward, really, which was, you know, Warlord had been pursuing this license. And the Chambers, I was supposed to do, obviously, mm-hmm. was, already had a relationship with Warlord due to working on Blood Red Skies. And obviously, we know nearly everyone there from X, the, nearly everyone there's X Games Workshop one way or another, you know. <laughs> Things like that, so you know, but a lot of already kind of personal relationships and work relationships with people there. So they approached Andy, and Andy, Andy and I worked particularly together on Battlefleet Gothic. We had a an interesting division there of labour, really, where because Andy had designed the basic game system right. uh, and, and kind of focused on that bit, and I kind of focused more on the background and narrative and scenario design and campaign design. And he remembered that working particularly well and knew that, you know, I was available and a, a freelancer on the pirate seas, as it were. So just got in touch and I asked if I was available to kind of to get the band back together to recreate that arrangement, really. <laughs> so and it was like the timing worked out. And obviously it was, yes, I thought, okay, I'll love to work on a Strongy Dog game. That sounds like a lot of fun. And Andy had done quite a bit of the work already in terms of the basic rules and things. So yeah, it, w- it was pretty much that straightforward of just finding the time to make it work with our schedules and then getting together, chatting over how it might work and then and going forward from there. Excellent. Presumably, obviously, you would have had to have done a fair amount of research um, <laughs> because uh, Strutting Dog, it's not I mean, it's not as difficult, I suppose, as Judge Dredd because Judge Dredd's got 44 years and there's a, I suppose there's a real classic phase of Strutting Dog that leads up to the final solution. Yeah. So it's maybe slightly more easy to get into than Dread, but even at that, there's still a lot of material there. I'm assuming you had to do a lot of rereading of those strips. And was there anything you were looking for in those stories in relation to adapting it to the tabletop? Yeah, so we, uh, sort of Rebellion provided us with digital files for, as I mentioned earlier, all the case files. So there's like four case files collections, I think, for, for Strontium Dog, plus a few extra bits and pieces. Um, so yeah, we sit down, read through all of those again, not at all arduous. <laughs> but like I say, it was good fun. And, and I kind of did it several times, really, particularly as ideas were developing. Obviously, kind of just looking out for stuff. So looking out for just, I, I did like names of weapons, places, people. So all, all essentially kind of facts based stuff that we could get into the game of like just either had to be on you know, Andy was doing the same so you know stuff the characters carried you know like the very famous Westinghouse variable cartridge blaster mm-hmm. and the different cartridges and uh, but you know lots of that kind of stuff gets dropped in you know there's again part of that world building is uh, certain things are, are very specific you know they get named uh, and various weapons and stuff but also it was agreed that this was going to be a narrative game I mean essentially Strunty Dog is a Wild West story in space you know he's a Wild West bounty hunter type character but it's in space rather than you know in the old west so uh, you know trying to look at what those conventions were and how so like the writing but also the art and stuff used that basic idea to tell the stories so uh, once I kind of started focusing on the scenarios and uh, in particular it was kind of looking up well, you know, what made a classic Strunty Dog story, whether it was like one prog long or 12 progs long and that's how we came up with this idea of like there's basically the the setup. There's the you know sometimes you jump straight into the action. Sometimes you know it's Johnny at the dog house getting the contract or whatever it might be. Then there's the actual job itself, and then there's the payoff. And so we decided to take that kind of fairly literally. They are the three stages of the kind of scenario in Strontium Dog and allowing it kind of to develop from there. So one of the things, again, you know, because we've worked on various skirmish level kind of games before, like, like Necromunda, but I've sort of I've written Cutlass for Black Scorpion Miniatures and Andy's done various other games as well. So we wanted to make sure, you know, well, what is, what is it about the game and the setup and the creation of the scenario stuff that it makes this, you know, definitely Stronty Dog? How do you make sure this isn't just, A, another skirmish game with the Strontium Dog names kind of taped over the top? So that idea of the protagonist having a job to do and then essentially the the other side being the obstacle that kind of gets in the way and originally the, 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 you know we'll get onto it a bit later but the, the idea of the chicanery in the armory cars kind of developed into that and added to the narrative but originally they, it was a little bit more of a complicated system and the chicanery was kind of bolted into the scenarios and the encounters and a bit more you know in terms of things that you, you had different options and stuff that you could do which we ended up streamlining into a card system but, but a lot of that was just taken directly out of the strips it was like looking at it, it like well this one they get captured by space pirates and have to escape uh, you know so or, uh, this particular job you know it's actually it goes wrong from the outset or all this kind of stuff. They're looking at the stories and thinking, well, okay, what what are the common factors that we can turn into this? And rather than just trying to recreate any one particular story, is then divide those out. I divided those out so you could combine them in different ways. Go well, you know, the way they start on, the model start on the table isn't necessarily just determined by what they're there to do, and that gave us quite a bit of variation then, without having to come up with too many too many variables that it'd be very hard to balance. Mm-hmm. One of the things I think is strongest about the game is 
I think what you're saying you were trying to achieve with having it narrative based and having it that's not just bolted on to Strontium Dog. I mean, it felt to me like it was very much in tandem with the strip and pushing those kind of themes and setting from the strip. I thought it was really flavorful, the whole thing overall. So it was like, it was really exciting for me as a, as a player and a fan of Strontium Dog, because I'm, which I'm first and foremost but um to see all these things translating onto the tabletop and i, I thought you did a, a great job of that yeah i mean as fans that's what you know luckily that's kind of like well what do, what would we want to see in a game and we were able to put it in there but yeah the presentation stuff was quite important of just like we would go around you know it might take weeks sometimes going around in circles just trying to find the, the right word for a thing you know it's like that the title of that card is that just does that sum up really what we want it to do or you know or injuries and cool and stunned and all these kinds of stuff and just thinking because you know at every level just going is this a strontium dog game is this what it would be you know rather again then rather than just like generic game words and things like that so yeah well I'm glad it, and I'm very glad it paid off really that just making sure that it, everything from the design itself just up to like I say the the layout and the choosing of the art and everything else was strongly dog all the way through yeah i think also fans of the strip would appreciate the focus on the narrative on it because obviously if you're a fan of those strips in the first place you, you enjoy the stories so the fact that you're encouraging players to create their own stories i think is a really important aspect to the game as well i was just wondering as well if, if there was any just kind of taking it back to the basics were there any key aspects of the strip that you were you thought these must be here obviously the gunfighter aspect the kind of wild west aspect You'd mentioned there. I was just wondering if there was any other key things or things as you were reading through that source material that threw kind of curveballs at you. If there was any unexpected ideas that ended up, you thought, "All right, we need to do this now." Something that you hadn't expected. I think there was. I can't. You know, I don't think there was any massive things, but I think there was always, particularly again with the armory and the chicanery and little bits and the scenarios, which were may have keyed off from just reading particular things or a particular panel. You know, mm. it's one of the reasons why the cards feature the art. You know, because they kind of came around in slightly different ways. Sometimes, you know, some of it was sort of like there'd be an idea for an interesting mechanic that we could then do. So, go okay, well, okay, well, how? What is this reflecting in terms of the narrative when this this kind of you know get to replace a star chip or whatever it might be? Then there was like say, so, yeah, stuff from the actual art or the story itself. Where you go, oh yeah, well, there's you know, say talk about the killing. You know, that classic kind of like, oh uh-huh, yeah, I've stuck behind them, or you know, that great moment when Johnny shoots through the wall and does the thing or you know there's lots of those moments and tricks and and or time bombs and stuff that are just iconic but also some that you, you actually reading through you remember go oh yeah there's that cool bit where he did you know he, play, he did this thing like oh it'd be cool if we could get that into the game or actually you know it kind of i suppose the point was uh, again particularly with the armor and chicanery cards of it, re- it really empowered the narrative, I suppose. That's the thing is like, because Johnny could just throw a time bomb at everybody if he wants to, you know, if, like, in theory. Obviously, that's supposed to be rare tech and all the rest of it and stuff. But obviously, by the power of narrative, that's not what happens. And he always, you know, it's like the times when he's not got a Westinghouse cartridge number four when he needs it and has to do something else in it. So we wanted to try and get that across. We didn't want it to be purely mechanistic of, oh, well, you know, X has this special ability. And again, you know, like, uh, oh, his war gear list is this long. But of course, he doesn't use everything in every strip. So... It was almost you get a number of different strontium dog components of a story and then put them together and create them, I suppose. And say so it was finding out what those elements were, whether they were physical things or thing, you know, like say like ploys, double crosses, all those kind of moments of you know heroism or cowardice, all those kinds of stuff. And then finding the, the, how we would mechanically integrate those into the game, I suppose. And everything came from that. I suppose that's what mattered. It wasn't necessarily about because things were kind of slightly, once we've settled on the kind of more card-based system, and there's a slight randomness that you can get away with stuff, so it, we didn't have to make sure every single thing was perfectly balanced because you weren't choosing these options and worrying about, is this three points or two points? It's like, no, actually, here's this is a bit of a curveball. Actually, here's a random thing kind of that happens, and then everybody has to kind of deal with it, which is kind of what happens in the strip. Mm. So I suppose there were some particular bits, like I say, where something like, I mean, it's even things like the bad rep card, for instance, where actually it changes the way you spend your money. You know, you can't buy allies as easily. So it wasn't just things that happened during the game, but before and after in some respects. So that idea of the setup and the payoff being as much part of the scenario as moving the miniatures around the table and, you know, kind of like the armory and collateral being, oh, sorry, uh, not collateral, um, chicanery being part of that. So from the moment you, you decide to play the game, as it were, you're already into the narrative, you know, the idea of, Again, you don't necessarily just have an army list that you've picked beforehand. You have a character who's going to be your leader and he's going to get some friends together and go and do a job. You know, that's kind of how it works sometimes, you know. 
that's how people like Midden Face or Kidney or whatever come into it. They're not they're necessarily always there from the start of the thing. They kind of get added to the story as it develops, and we wanted the scenarios and the, the kind of like the bands to go the same way. Yeah, that was one of the things I thought was fun that there was an, the narrative was was continuing through from the, the start to the end of the game, even out with the actual scenario. Sometimes there were these kind of twists in it. So that was a lot of fun and it really is flavourful again to the strip where there was always constant kind of backstabbing and little twists that characters were, you know, pulling a fast one in another character. And I like I love the fact that it was, you know, as you say, all the way through the game. And also picking up on what you were saying there about Midden Face, probably my favourite Strutting Dog story is Outlaw, where it starts off it's pretty much just Wolf and, and Johnny. And as the game goes on, <laughs> uh, sorry, the game, <laughs> as, the, as the story goes on, they pick up other members of the Strontium Dog ones, Midden Face being the kind of key ally, but also a, a number of other ones. So yes. I really appreciated when I was getting into the kind of campaign side of things that you were building your band as it went on. And it reminded me of that story, which was which was great for me because it's my yeah. favourite. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing, I think, is there's there's actually a very broad range of stories there, but with a, they all have fairly similar beats because for the, the kind of simple concept of a, a bounty hunter, which is you'd go out and either shoot somebody or capture somebody. They've spun it out in many, many different ways, and almost it's almost never actually about that in the end. The stories, <laughs> you know, and half the time Johnny and Wolf, in particular, end up doing something. You know, they end. It's a bit um, kind of man with no name or whatever. It's like they end up having to play a bigger part than just being the guy that brings in the bad guys. They save a the community. They do. You know, like I said, it's that kind of like Western heroic thing of uh, they're not necessarily gone there to do that but their presence there and their own particular code of morals means that then they have to fight for the little guys or they have to bring down the tyrant or whatever you know which it wasn't necessarily part of their deal of them going and isn't actually doesn't get them any bounty or whatever and that, and that was this kind of thing again creating the scenarios of it wasn't always just about going in and trying to take out somebody although there are, is a couple of the scenarios and, and also the idea that you could have outlaws versus outlaws because there, there's a feeling that it'd be cool like, to do sort of what ifs if Bubo's bad boys, you know, kind of took on Bubba's gang, what would it be like? Mm-hmm. Uh, that'd be quite, those, those kind of, be able to create a set of scenarios that didn't even necessarily involve a strontium dog doing stuff, but actually would still have the similar sort of feel to it. Or you could imagine it going on in the same universe, just slightly off screen. Yeah, that makes sense to me, because you would think that some of these bands would have had run-ins at some point. Um, yeah, possibly. And, and the fun is just, the, that's what we get to do with the game, is do stuff that you go, okay, you know, yeah. Let's uh, let's pitch the Sticks Brothers versus whoever and find out who's going to be top dog kind of thing. <laughs> Sticks all the way for me. I love the Sticks, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so taking it back to the kind of start then of the process of the game design, I was, I was just wondering if you would like to discuss a little bit about that and which aspects of the project that you, you most enjoyed working on. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was really cool to work with Andy again. So as I said, you know, we'd, we'd obviously spent quite a long time working together uh, games workshop but it was you know it was nice to kind of be able to kind of bounce ideas each off each other and, and kind of so although he had the basic mechanics down and uh, we were still kind of refining that as we were developing the scenarios and as i was kind of working on the campaign system and things and so actually just just honing in on that i suppose actually making sure we had that focus on the narrative so playing a game but not just thinking of like as a tactical exercise and stuff but you know what would be the cool thing to do here how do we encourage people and reward people, I suppose, for playing in certain ways? And, and, you know, and from the point of view of what I was focused on, it's like, well, how do I create scenarios that are exciting? And the biggest issue whenever you're doing any kind of scenario design particularly is how to get around the idea that the best way to win is just take out everybody else, you know, and then go and sit on an objective or then go and do whatever it is. And how do you actually encourage people to kind of play to the mission, play to the story, and, and that's quite a, an interesting when you've got a very specific narrative and, and style that you want to get across as well, rather than just I want people to consider different tactical options. But it's like, oh no, I want Johnny and Wolf versus the Bubba Gang to feel like Johnny and Wolf versus the Bubba Gang, uh, and, and feel like that showdown or that shootout or that ambush or the whatever it is that we're trying to recreate in the scenario feels like it did in the strip. But to the point where you go, actually, but but here it gets to deviate because you're playing it differently. Uh, and that was a lot of fun, you know, there's a lot of iteration, reiteration, I suppose, of playing the same things again, while at the same time trying to try out the different kind of chicanery cards. And and the thing is, you got, <laughs> when you've got very complicated, you know, both sides of the things, which tends to what happens during game design, and then you kind of have a, a then a, a very abrupt period of rationalisation, 
Okay, well, I didn't take out loads of stuff, but once we kind of settled on the armory and chicanery system and the idea that you could actually spend, I came up with that, you know, you could actually just spend chicanery cards to do other things. So it gave me an opportunity to like, you know, oh, you can use it to get more allies or you can, they're not just limited to what's on the card, but they're almost a type of currency that you can use during the game. That made everything, a lot of the things that I wanted people to be able to do very easy because actually it, uh, there was just a common way of doing it. And then we could just focus then on the different characters and are their stats, you know, reflective of how good they are and, and everything kind of settled down again, which was nice, I suppose. But actually, you know, I, I like the exercise of trying to crunch stuff and get it to work. Um, <laughs> but also I've always been that, I've always kind of approached games from, it's all about, nobody particularly says, I always, <laughs> I always remember um, on to a slight tangent here, but I always remember in Red Dwarf when and Rimmer's recounting his risk stories. And he's right, and he's basically said, and then I rolled a five and a four, uh, which was good. But then he rolled a three, a two, and a one. And I'm, uh, but then I rolled a double six, um, and it's just the most <laughs> boring thing in the world. And actually, of course, nobody remembers what they rolled. Everyone remembers what the story was. So everyone remembers that general running away from a the Griffin charge, or everyone remembers, you know, Johnny getting shot in the head by a waster. Or do you know what I mean? So it's like what creates story on the tabletop that you're going to remember and chat about in the pub afterwards. Yeah. In the same way that what's that moment in the strip that you go you take away from it that panel that line of dialogue so yeah and it's fun it was fun creating those moments and having those moments you know playing games with andy and you know that was really fun that was cool i'm enjoying playing this game we must be getting it right (laughs) (laughs) oh definitely it's a lot of fun because all those aspects probably that well i think andy had said you did a lot of the work on the armory and chicanery cards which are uh, you know some of my favorite aspects of the game because they do absolutely pack the flavor in as you, as you mentioned there, they show the specific panels from the comics itself and kind of call back to that and, you know, create that actual immediacy with the strip because it says where is art that you're looking at and it has the actual panels and the speech bubbles and they're relevant to what's happening in the game. They must have been a lot of fun to design. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the thing that made it. I mean, there's, there's there's cool stuff in there, the chip system and, you know, and the and the special dice, which kind of uh, sort of an offshoot slightly from the bolt action system and things like that. So, so there's a, there's a bit of commonality of Warlord games style anyway that Andy had kind of picked up on and was deliberately using. But I think the armory and chicanery cards was what when once we kind of twigged how to do that properly, we were like, no, actually, this is what makes the game Shunty Dog, mm-hmm. and really this is where we can put so much flavour in. And, and it's, some of it's in the character design and that special rules and stuff. But yeah, I think that's where you know even aside from what. I did with the scenarios and things. The, each of those is like a little scenario in a pack or in a pack of cards already, because of their interactions and because because they essentially circumvent the normal narrative of the game that you get to take another turn or do a thing or shoot away or take cover or do all these kind of things. Those are very likely to create some of those moments that I was just talking about. You know, the the sudden aha. Well, actually, I've got my um, zip line. I'm going to actually just move from one side of the battlefield to the other, and suddenly the game's completely changed. Or Johnny's going to fire off a Westinghouse number four cartridge or, or whatever those go beyond mechanics i think you know they it doesn't matter quite what your shoot or your fight or your call is because those cards are kind of almost equally accessible as well so even all the characters get to play in that as well i think that's the fun thing so yeah the, i mean there's a reason as well i mean we had more than we could do which is why you know it's kind of cool to put them we had extras we could put in the packs of individual miniatures and it's one of those things because we've we've gone on to sort of like think about more ways we could do this in some of the other we've worked on a couple more of these titles that haven't out yet and, and obviously we've all lot of got ongoing plans for them and stuff but actually those cards have become quite key to what makes the 2000 AD licensed games I think and uh, and in the future we've thought of other ways we can make sure that they're kind of fairly core to the game system really. Mm. Well, that's exciting because as I say they're some of my favourite aspects in the game with those cards and again because it does create that bridge automatically to the strip which is where everybody's love started and just makes you feel like you're in that universe when these things happen in the game and I do like the randomness of it that sometimes you can get great cards and sometimes they're not the ones that you want and that's just the way it goes and that's again feels like the strip because sometimes things go their way and sometimes they don't yeah it's got that real unpredictability about it which i think is a a lot of fun because it's some of the more traditional games that i've played in the past that i'm not slating them in any way they're they're, um, but some of the previous games that i've played you can tell sometimes how it's going to play out because one side kind of begins to get the upper hand but with the strontium dog system i always feel that 
even sometimes when you've got the upper hand in it, that sometimes a chicanery card is going to just suddenly come out there and it's going to flip the whole thing in its head, which is which is great fun because it means that you can always predict how it's going to play out. And I think that's a really a really successful aspect of the of the game that he's he's brought. I think yeah, I mean I think you've yeah, you've hit it there really. It's unpredictability. One of the things I think makes things entertaining is being unpredictable, not quite knowing where they go. And there's something intrinsic in like say, yeah, chicanery and armory cards could do that. But there's also, you know, one of the things that we're very pleased kind of as a feature is that even the toughest characters can flip quite quickly once they get hurt. You know, the the way the rules work Actually, you know, Johnny, call five, you know, high shoot and all that, can go around blasting bad guys for ages. But actually, if you clip him a couple of times, suddenly he's really not all of that, you know, and he has to die for cover. And again, he's not invulnerable. So we get this nice blend of like being very competent and very intimidating him and Wolf or, you know, the Sticks brothers or whoever it might be. Some of these characters are, you know, quite nasty, but actually... They can get taken down by a bunch of wasters if you try and get a bit of luck or, like I say, or with the assistance of a card. And suddenly once they flip, then it can get quite nasty quite quickly <laughs> for them. <laughs> yeah. So you can't get too cocky, put it that way. Yeah. And since you've mentioned the star chips system, that does also bring a, an element of unpredictability to the table because sometimes you're really lucky sending your chips back to the bag again. Yeah. Sorry, I should explain this. If characters have got a cool of three or less, just get a normal chip and each turn the chip comes out, you apply it to characters. If it's a normal chip, that's their activation done, that's the end of it. Whereas if it's if a cool of four or above, it's a star chip they get and you can attempt to return that to the bag by making a, a cool test. And yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. So it, it's um, it's an interesting one because sometimes you're really lucky with it and Johnny can really go on a rampage like he does in the strip sometimes. <laughs> he can... Absolutely, yeah, he can be lethal. You know? yeah. He's rolling five dice, there's a very good chance he could put it back in. But then if he doesn't and he's halfway out of cover with his bum showing, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's like... I didn't want to fail that one. <laughs> so that, that was another aspect of the game I thought brought that unpredictability to it. And again, I, I liked how it, like sometimes it would work for Johnny and sometimes it wouldn't, that He's not a god, as you say. And yeah, you can if he gets caught out, then he's he can be in trouble. And there's a few times I've had that. I've kind of I've ran him behind the building, and he's hunkering down while the uh, outlaws are kind of swarming around and things like that. So yeah, again, un- totally unpredictable, which is which is a fun. Uh, yeah, I think it kind of sorry it encapsulates that idea of like any plan is only as good as it is until contact with the enemy, sort of thing. Mm. Which you know, like I say, some games almost they'll work like clockwork. You know, you might get some bad rolls and stuff, but actually you turn up with your team, gang, whatever, and you've already worked out the synergies and you know what they're going to do and you know what the opponents are capable of. So if you're good, you know, and a good player, hopefully you'll win and everything. And the, the same is true of Johnny Dog. It doesn't suffer fools. You know, you could do dumb stuff and you won't get away with it. But actually, it's much more emergent, the strategy, because of the chip system. You know, sometimes it's like, I just want to activate my goons, and you draw the star chip. It's like, well, how am I going to use the star chip on the goons? Uh, I really need them to move now. I'm going to have to waste that star chip, basically, on just moving goons. And suddenly, you're going to have to adapt your plans. And then sometimes, like I say, you get the opportunities, actually. You, you go for a risk and you go, oh, actually, yeah, that, I'll try and put the chip back in, and you get a good roll when you weren't actually expecting it, or whatever it might be, on the on the last chip and you just get a bit of a bonus and, and get to run with it. And I think that's, I say, yeah, that adds to the fun. Narrative is unpredictability. is the, It's the stuff that didn't necessarily go to plan and was either better than you expected or worse than you expected. And that are the things that you remember afterwards. Mm. And sorry, just coming back to the chicanery cards there, I was just wondering if there was any aspects from the, when you were adapting it from, when you were looking at these things from the strip, was there anything you really wanted to put in there that you felt couldn't be translated to the tabletop? Or I can't, to be honest myself, I can't really think of examples of anything I saw on the strip. But... No, no, I'll say, yeah, I mean, <laughs> If I read through read through the strips again now, I'd think oh, that'd be a cool bit. 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 But actually, I think generally we got nearly everything covered. I guess uh, both in terms of fun stuff you'd want to do in the game, and also just recreating iconic moments from the strip itself. Yeah. I mean, there were, and like I said, we got to kind of play around with a few extras that come in, like the extra model packs and things. So although we, had, I think it's like eight, it's eighteen cards. I can't remember how many cards there is now. Yeah, I was counting. I've got the book next to me. Yeah, so there's 18. We ended up with a pack of 36. That's right. 18 cards, armory. 18. We managed to get a few more extras in. But yeah, there's room for more, I suppose. That's what's, again, you can tell the idea works if actually you think, actually, there could be a few more and it wouldn't, I don't think we'll be stretching it too much because, let's like say, because they're slightly unpredictable, because they are, they're not something you can 
uh, you're certain to get or anything like that. You can have stuff that's just kind of more fun. It's not about, oh, I'm going to play this card at the right moment and we win me the game. It's like, actually, I'm just going to create an interesting moment that gives me a slight advantage mm-hmm. um, if I play this right. And if it doesn't, the other thing is, at the end of the game, if you've not used them, if you haven't had the opportunity, then they, you can just trade them in for essentially for victory points. So there's also just a little bit of a thing of like, I'm actually spending my victory points to get advantages here. So is there, a, as a profit and loss tactical decision, there's actually something there as well of like, do I want to really use this kind of sneak attack now is that is that going to give me sufficient advantage that it's worth giving up that kind of fifty thousand credits bonus that i can trade it in for at the end of the game which is you know it's quite fun but also it, it gives us by making every card have multiple uses it kind of takes the pressure off you know it's not like this is one of your three spells and every spell has to be good because if you don't use it you're going to feel disappointed it's like well actually you know or you can just toss it and and get an extra star chip for a turn because they're always useful I guess is what it comes down to within the game, which means that you get a lot of freedom just to have fun with what they represent or what they actually do in the rules. Yeah. And as I mentioned before, that as well as them being fun in their own right, they do provide that level of narrative to the game, which in general terms, unless you, you want to do that kind of thing, it's kind of lacking in a lot, a lot of tabletop games. Did you feel that encouraging players to create their own stories similar to those that they already loved in the comic was an important element in connecting fans to the game? Yeah, I think so, because that's... Yeah, because this was about there's you know there's a nostalgia element there, particularly with you know obviously the Strong Dogs actually still been running up until recently and resurrected and various other you know new storylines and stuff. But for us, particularly, we we're hitting that sweet spot that we were kind of talking about earlier, really of like what would be classic Strong Team Dog. But like a lot of the original stories and original runs, which you know still covered a fairly long period of years. But yeah, I think uh, from my point of view, it's like I'm an okay gamer, but I probably lose more than I win. So I want to make sure it's fun. Andy's a very good gamer. We always had to kind of take that into account in the playtesting. <laughs> <laughs> in the waiting of how, how well did they do? It's like make sure we swap sides and try again <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, and make sure we, you know, okay, you can be attacking this time, Andy, because I clearly don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Which is kind of hard as well when you've got. It's one of the things about designing a game is there's two things. You have to kind of, it's like, well, is this not working or do we just not know how to play yet? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you know, this scenario doesn't seem, you know, it's like, oh, this seems really difficult. Is it because it's just really difficult because the objectives are too far away or whatever, the setup's not right? Or or is it just difficult because I haven't, I'm just not playing it very well because I've only played it twice? And, and they're kind of operating in this slightly gray area and you always are. Now, if you've got like external play testers and loads of time and stuff, obviously you can mitigate that with having lots of people playing and putting the results in and crunching numbers and stuff. But we have got that, you know, it's basically me and Andy, when we're hitting our flow, we're basically playing a couple of games, you know, getting together, trying to get two games in a week maybe, and then relying on experience. <laughs> Uh, to kind of like extrapolate from that what that kind of meant for the you know the game system as a whole but always for me yeah it's about did i have fun in this game mm. even if i didn't necessarily i mean there was one game i can't remember which is it was one of the scenarios where there was like you have to pick up the cache marker so it's like one of the robbery type yeah. games or something and we were testing we were bad boys so they're all mounted and essentially it was one turn because they they charged on they're really fast they grabbed all the stuff and they all and they and they basically ran off again and that was it. And and on the face of it, you go, well, that was really unbalanced and boring, you know, and that should be really boring. But it wasn't because I actually, I had Durham Red. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was testing Durham Red and I think I had Mid and Face. And so I had a fair few number of, and I had a whole bunch of Wasters and, and Goons, I think, as allies and stuff. And and it actually came down to, I think I had a Shikani card, it came down to a last like long range pistol shot into the back of uh, Bubo himself, just as he was about to leave the table. And if that had worked, then I'd get another turn. So although actually it was a whitewash, and if you look at the results, playing through it was really fun. And it never felt like it until at the end and went, well, okay. Yeah. And it's all like Andy was, and I were thinking, well, do we need to tweak the scenario for mounted characters? Is that a bit too easy? It was like, well, I, you know, I mean, maybe adjusted things slightly, but actually because it was still fun and it didn't matter. Because the thing is, you know, if you did that and that happened, it's like, it's cool, good. Okay, well, let's play the next game. And that only took half an hour. We've got time for another game now. Yeah. And that was the other thing you've got, you know, with a smaller kind of skirmish game, rather than setting up a big hours and hours long, you know, massive bot battle or whatever. It's like, cool, well, let's play again. And I'm going to win this time. <laughs> you know, let's see what we're starting to get this time. So, you know, while balance was a thing, it's within a margin of error. And part of that margin is is fun and playability, not just kind of crunchy, balancey. Because like I said, that takes that, that essentially the narrower you make those margins, the more predictable you make things and actually less fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
you know, there's a, there's a sweet spot you want to hit where you go, you feel like you've got a chance of winning and it's going to be fun playing it and, and everything else. And, and hopefully, you know, well, from feedback, it seems that we've got there. And that's why for me, the narrative was important because if that narrative hadn't been there, if it hadn't been for those, those kind of key moments, that would have been a boring game. Mm-hmm. We've had to redesign it, you know, that particular scenario, or we've had to, like, well, we had mounted troops because we've got, so we had to kind of, because of them somehow. So it's like either we toss out that scenario, which seems bad, or we just make sure one way or another it's entertaining. And, uh, well, it was. So uh, I think job done there. That was, that was good. And you've also just, I think you've probably just given a whole lot of, uh, made a whole lot of gamers feel a lot better. The people that maybe don't <laughs> don't have a lot of success, <laughs> but it's okay to, to lose sometimes and not do well. Gives us all heart. <laughs> you can definitely blame the cards on this. You know, it's, like, it's not my fault. If I, you know, it's like, you know, you can be whatever it might be. If only, if only that, yeah, fair, I would have got away for it if it hadn't been for those pesky bounty hunters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, since you mentioned their mid and face in Durham Red, another thing I thought was really strong was the, the individual characters with all the kind of key heroes, if you like. They all had abilities that reflected their actions and personalities in the strip. I'm just wondering which of these were your personal favourites. Because I mean, well, we used them so much and because we had to get them right and stuff. I mean, I, it's still Johnny and Wolf. I don't know, because, I mean, most of the playing was, because it was going to be the contents of the box and stuff, but also it gave us a nice rounded thing, was Johnny and Wolf and Gronk versus Bubba in the game. Because that was kind of just, that was our, I suppose that was our control pool. of like, once we got those right, then we could make everyone else right. But I suppose the feeling of just being Johnny and Wolf and then fighting like Johnny and Wolf and Wolf getting up close and personal with the happy stick, although he's actually a pretty good shot as well. But, you know, and... And Johnny there, you know, shooting off, taking bad guys down with his pistol and, and then, you know, maybe getting out a pair of electro nuts at close range and stuff. It's just fun. It's Because that is the strip. That's the, as much as there's, like, you can have, like, say, Darren Red and Midden Face versus a bunch of howlers on walks and stuff like that. Recreating the strip with uh, Johnny and Wolf versus somebody is the best bit, you know, it's like, yeah. or against them, you know, as, you know, or, or be trying to take them down, trying to take them down a notch and be, this will be the one that Johnny never walked away from. You know, <laughs> I'm the guy that beat Johnny. He's always got he's, he's always got a target on his back, kind of stuff. And doing it with characters that you know and love from the stories. So, but that said, you know, I also you mentioned the sticks there. I really enjoyed the sticks and the first time I tried them out and the kind of the, the utter stoic unmovableness of them, almost because they're kind of slow and deliberate and just very Lee Van Cleef kind of characters, aren't they? Um, yeah. And, and the first time I played them, I'm like, oh, actually, they're good. Because, again, they're gunfighters, but actually work very differently to a gunfighter like Johnny. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll just sit there and just trade shots with you, basically. Uh, whereas you're kind of hopping around and trying to use cover and maybe get an angle or using his speed and stuff like that. They're just there going bang, bang, bang until you're dead. So, yeah, they're, they're good fun. Yeah, and I like um, I liked Midden Face as well, because, again, he's just quite a fun character from the strip. So he's quite fun to have in the game. Yeah, he was... For the same thing. You can obviously do the accent better. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, you know, like, he gets some of the best lines. The, you know, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. You just get to use them again. I, you know, I could probably do a whole chicanery deck of just, like, it was hard not to just do a whole deck of like <laughs> midden face quotes, basically. <laughs> but he does appear with probably a, a greater proportion of them. I think there's probably Johnny's on more. But, you know, of secondary characters, midden face features quite heavily in quite a few of the chicanery cards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he is my favourite character for, for obvious reasons. I, I do relate a lot to. I, I get the character a lot. I think most people do anyway, but yeah. it was interesting that you mentioned about Johnny and Wolf there because I had a conversation actually the other night online with somebody about Sonic Dog and and they were saying about how they always want to have Midden Face on the team. Right. And, I, and one of the things that was interesting about it was that he's my favourite character, but he would always be secondary to Wolf because I felt that, like you said, Johnny and Wolf are the, the focus of the strip. It's the two of them, you know, for the most part. So I always kind of felt I would add midden face on after that but i would always the same as yourself i would always want johnny and wolf because that's the heart of the strip if you like and it kind of feels wrong not having wolf on the table absolutely the idea of johnny and midden face you're like right okay yeah i can see that you know and that's a bit of an exception but clearly wolf's close or are they avenging wolf is he in the hospital is that you know what i mean you'd have to come up with a story <laughs> of why wolf isn't there you know is this is this one of the side stories of rage after wolf was killed but we didn't see you know or something like that where, where mid face is trying to bring Johnny back or something like that. Yeah, it, it is. To be honest, in the same way that, you know, again, you can do it, but it's like, oh, I've got Durham Red and mid face and Gronk. And you're like, Gronk? <laughs> What's he doing hanging around with them? It's like, well, yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, again, just the associations, if not the rules, 
make yeah. make you go down certain paths or having you know having a sticks and, and it's quite fun sometimes mixing up by having a six in Bubba's gang or having Bubba and the the weirds or something like that. It's kind of cool, and I think and certainly on the outlaw side you can mix stuff up a little bit. But yeah, you, it's why it's kind of focused around that leader character, I suppose, and the setup of it. It's like you are Johnny or you are Bubba or you are a sticks or you are someone. And I thought that association was quite important rather than you are a generic player. It's like no, one of the things I kind of learned from Warhammer in particular was that idea of having a model on the table that you associate with that slightly role-playing aspect of like, aha, this is the general, who is kind of me? And then actually everything springs from that rather than just an, a leader of a gang go, well, actually that can change. Because like I say, but yeah, it's Johnny Wolf, isn't it? Cause, and I think that's interesting because you don't have to write that into the rules. And, you know, they've got nice synergy where they work together. But again, even if they didn't necessarily, and we, because we, want, we knew people would fight with them together a lot, so that's why it works. But... It's just it's just self evident for anyone who likes the strip. I'd be curious people who don't necessarily who've come to the game. You know, I, I'm very curious about the people that play the game actually that don't necessarily have that depth of experience with the strips and stuff. Who've kind of seen this cool sci-fi skirmish game, and all they really know is from the game itself. And there's, there's bound to be some people out there like that. I don't know. But they, you know like, yeah, I was going to. I was going to add a wee note there to say that just because I feel like I should be playing with Johnny and Wolf all the time doesn't mean that MD who isn't can attach to the strip can you know you've got all these different options all these allies and yeah I think probably if you weren't involved with the source material so much you would possibly mix up a lot more than fans of the strip would but it works you know I have played with different bands for all sorts now outlaws and I've, like you said I've had the, the sticks as allies for outlaws as well because the sticks do that in the, the comic as well so yeah. I have tried a whole load of variations on it which is uh, which is a lot of fun so I don't really want to create the impression either that you have to play with Johnny and Wolf uh, just in case that came across as that way at the moment yeah, yeah. I think that's the thing. It's like, and like I say, as you go on, I think, and if, as you play more games, you might vary stuff a bit. But then actually part of the reason of varying it is so that you can have a little bit of a break and then get back to playing Johnny and Wolf. <laughs> so. <laughs> Absolutely. So I was just wondering, were there any special abilities in the strip that you found particularly difficult to translate to the t- tabletop? I'm talking specifically about the characters still, sorry. Um, I don't think there are any stuff that's particularly difficult. I suppose one of the... One of the things that's kind of a bit different about Strontium Dog as a property versus some other ones is it's full of very cosmetic or very debilitating mutations and stuff. So actually, and it's not one of those where you're, aha, they're not X-Men, put it that way. Yeah. You know, mutants are not cool. Yeah. Johnny's the only one that's something useful, really. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that was was it. And again, it was like, that was one of the the things, I suppose, was, again, how we were going to handle Johnny's, Johnny's eyes. Johnny's strange eyes, because again they they operate with the power of narrative mm-hmm. in the strip. Depending on what they, you know, he can either read your thoughts or he can look through cover or he can just freak you out or he can do all kinds of stuff depending on what it is the writer wants him to do at a particular time. <laughs> and so again, it was one of those where we could either try and write a whole list of special rules in Johnny's entry about what Johnny's gaze did and all that kind of stuff. Or actually, it was much more of a, well, here's a couple of exceptions in the scenarios and things that Johnny gets to do. Uh, here's an ability, and actually, uh, of what you know, he can do kind of pretty much all the time. Which is, But actually, if you've got Johnny in certain situations, his eyes give you this kind of advantage or give this this kind of thing. So that, again, it had that similar ability. It was a bit like his eyes were still kind of treated in the same way as a time bomb or a number four cartridge in there. It wasn't a thing that was, you know, there was a use to it on a kind of standard level, but actually he didn't get to do all the things, all the crazy things all of the time. Also, just for kind of just keeping him in check, really, uh, as a character, you know, like I say, he's, he's a tough nut as it is without him basically being able to just, like, because you want him running around shooting things as well most of the time rather than putting the glam on people and, and trying to use their thoughts or freak them out or guess what they're going to do next and stuff. So if anything, that kind of presented one of the main challenges was how to, to incorporate potentially powerful, a very powerful ability, but in a way that wasn't going to dominate and essentially make him really expensive. And actually, but also when you get very powerful characters who can do lots of things, they tend to start fighting against each other. They can't do all of the things all of the time. And so actually they end up, you know, you could end up having a very high notoriety, but actually not quite worth it because actually you're paying for redundancy almost mm-hmm. and things like that. So as a matter of kind of just a bit of a game balance issue as well. But a lot of it, you know, like I say, with the build of Muti kind of pack and stuff, it's more a case of generally cosmetic 
stuff, you know, or if it added to the story, say, like, you know, Kidney is, is a classic character of life, because he's just, he's actually not that great a bounty hunter, really, but he kind of was in the prime, but you never really, it's only in the later strips, I think, like in the Strontium Dogs strip, when he's he's kind of hanging around with Darren Red a bit more and stuff, that you can see him doing more stuff, whereas he's a bit of a comedy character, and he's a down and out and stuff in the classic strips. But actually, there's pros and cons to having your face in your knee. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's the cons? How do we translate that into the game? But a lot of them, yeah, like I say, it's kind of like, here's a cool model, but we're not going to try and write a rule for every kind of little mutation, I think, because that's not the way they work in the strip. They're not superpowers. They're, they're either deformities or they're, you know, uh, something that kind of actually uh, is more inhibiting than it is freeing. Yeah, definitely it is. It's interesting what you were saying about the character of Johnny, because one of the things, as somebody that was kind of so linked to the source material was, I was aware that I could really game Johnny as a character. In other words, stick him at the back of the battlefield and put him behind the building and just use his variable blaster and his, his kind of weird eyes, as it were. But it just did not sit right with me at all to do that. And to me, it actually wasn't fun. You want to put the fun yeah. first and foremost. He's a hero. He should be getting out there running among, shooting the place up left, right and centre. But I also think it's it's okay to do that. Sometimes if you're, like you were saying earlier on, if Johnny's getting wounded, which he, he can get in quite a bad state, then, you know, it's it's a reasonable tactic to then get behind cover and to make use of those abilities. But yeah, yeah I didn't want to play him that way. I just, it just didn't feel right at all. So I would imagine that most people who are playing this, that are fans of the strip, just wouldn't really go there either, to be honest. I suppose it depends what you want from the game, whether you're more interested in winning or making a story and then obviously the, as you've said there's so much for the game that i think most people wouldn't necessarily game it like that yes yeah. and it also depends on just whether that's the most useful way for well, probably your most expensive character just as basically a support model shooting so you know i say he's very good and it, that's quite an effective thing but actually when you get to the payoff and you work out you know actually how many things did i capture how many things you know it's like was that the best use of a guy who's actually also pretty handy in close combat and quite fast and you know there's there's way there's ways of means but you're right i think people's natural inclination is just driven by the narrative anyway i think you, what you absolutely don't want to do is penalize people for doing that mm. i don't think you know the people that feel like oh if i play wolf like wolf somehow actually it's penalizing me in the game because actually the, you know, if if that was the idea of wolf is actually he stands at the back and provides covering fire or whatever then you've we've got it slightly wrong so if you're encouraged, you know, th there are different ways you can play stuff. And obviously, you know, you just have to weigh the benefits of any, any particular kind of approach during the game. But hopefully over the course of several games and different situations and scenarios, you get, you feel like playing them as the characters is probably at least, if not just narratively rewarding, but at least making use of their abilities in a tactically useful way, I guess. But yeah, for Johnny in particular, it was one of those real balancing acts because he's the central character mm -hmm. and we want it to be good and you know without work having worked it on myself you know i can imagine the judges and dread in particular being the same for the judge dread game it's like well you need to for somebody who basically just turns up and shoots the bad guys it's like how do you mess with that how do you you know as a writer in the strip you have to find ways to mess with that and as a designer in a game you have to find ways to mess with that so that they have to think a bit more outside the box and things so hopefully you know that's kind of one of the things that comes through in the particularly like campaign and scenarios is that playing to type, I suppose, is beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. I th and, and as I say, it's more, to be honest, because certainly Wolf, I do feel that you're encouraged to get him in amongst with a happy stick and start yeah. battering down things. It was just, it's not that I think Johnny is designed to do that. Like I say, kind of camping, as it were. It's just more that I was aware of the fact that I could abuse that i feel like <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> like you said there's no fun in that to me it's the fun is having johnny in amongst the action shooting the place up hopefully getting that star chip out back out the bag again yeah. well back into it and back out again so that you can go on these kind of rampages that, that to me is far more fun than just sitting at the back of a battlefield behind a building or something, or something like that so yeah sorry if i again creating a, a false impression there it's not it doesn't come through to me that that's how you should play it something that occurred to me when I was doing it and I, I can't mm -hmm. do that, can't do it. Yes. You mentioned there about the scenarios or jobs as they're called in Strontium Dog. Yeah. And again, these brought more narrative and, and variety of play to the tabletop. I was wondering if you maybe tell the listeners a little bit about how you developed these and if you had a, any particular favourites yourself. 
Yes, so the jobs, as uh, so I explained before, like, you know, the scenarios themselves break into two parts, which is the jobs and the encounters. So it's a way of just kind of being, making a bit more variation and again, a little bit less predictability in terms of what you'd be facing. It's the fundamental unit of Strongly Dog is the job. <laughs> you know, it's like the narrative arc is one job, whether that's, let's like say, whether that's one prog or three or five or whatever. You know, it's either it's the shickle group of grab or it's the killing, uh, which is what they're there to do. Oh, and again, talking about like very particular words and stuff and how they can make a difference. So, which is why one character is the protagonist. Originally, we sort of like we, we use like terms like attacker and defender or uh, various other ones, but actually having protagonists, putting people in the position of a narrative character, you know, your role is protagonist in this story, just makes a little, again, it's not a big deal, when I, but it's just another little thing that kind of puts people's heads in the right place. So the idea that the protagonist is there to achieve something, they're, they're basically, they're there for a payday of some kind which is you know, the heart of the strip for the most part is Johnny and Wolf turn up and they're on a job. And so, and then the encounter part of it is actually basically how did that job come about? So actually, you know, are they attacking somebody at their base or is it, you know, an ambush in the street or are they out in the wilds? Have they had the tables turned on them? That kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. One of my favourites, I think because it's the Space Western, my favourite probably is the Showdown kind of and parley type one so it's not just a, it's not a gunfight from the start there's actually a little bit of tension about who's going to start firing first and some kind of like headology of like maneuvering for position without trying to show your hand too much so it's a nice little slow burn start and then when it and then it all kind of uh somebody draws and then it all kicks off which i think is yeah and that's kind of like that's the most western story i can think of which makes it very stronty it made me the, uh, the good, bad, and ugly, the kind of big showdown between the three of them in the, the circle. I really loved that scenario for that reason because I'm a huge fan of those films as well. Just like, yes. yeah, they're all kind of, you know, it's like they're all um, eyeballing each other before who's going to make the first move. And Absolutely, yeah. That was great fun, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but I think you know, there's also quite like the one with the, uh, the C's one as well, where there's like an informant or kind of person of interest. So actually, and they are a model that kind of gets to move and fight and things. So again, they're not, it, it's not just a marker on a table that you're trying to capture. It's a person, and that person might be just a bit of an inept klutz that you're just trying to keep safe or whatever, or could be quite dangerous in their own right, depending on a dice roll at the start of the scenario. It's like you turn up to seize someone, and actually they, they turn out to have a, a pretty good gun and a, a fairly good shot. And you're like, all oh, right, actually, um. But again, that was one as well where there was a decision that you can make you know, you can make if you think they're going to get captured, the defender can choose to try and take them out themselves instead <laughs> so that they don't get, because they have to be subdued and taken out. So it's like actually killing the informant. So the game can swap almost. once, And once they try and take out the informant or whoever the person of interest is, then actually they're fighting on both sides. So there's a lot of to and fro then of like, you know, you might be trying to drag him off the table edge at one point and, and try and move them away from the trouble with the next they're uh, actually turning on their guns on you because you've you know you tried to take them out and failed or whatever. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think those are quite fun. And and uh, for me, you know, there's a couple of standard ones like the headhunt and things, which are kind of pretty much you know that's Johnny that's a Johnny Alpha story is there to take somebody out, yeah. you know, dead or alive. Uh, you're coming with me, kind of thing. Which are quite you know, and then there's lots of wrinkles around that. I think that's that's what I'd call the core Johnny story really. But actually, I like I like the ones that are a little bit further out there, like I say, a bit more narrative even than that, which is like the showdown or the the seas type, the the ones that have got st- objectives that aren't just about taking out guys on the other side, really. Yeah, and all the options that are there give it a good variety of play that feels like things are constantly changing when you're playing, a, particularly when you're playing a campaign. Speaking of which, in the previous podcast with Andy, I matched Max Bubba's criminality by neglecting to discuss the Strutting Dog Miniatures game campaign <laughs> system, which is which is really great, and it was a major oversight on my part, so I apologise to listeners. So perhaps we can put that to rights, and I was wondering if you could maybe say a little bit about it and how it deepens the whole Strutting Dog experience. Yes, uh, I mean, as as sort of noted in the book, I suppose one of the one of the one of the keys about the key things we wanted to do with the campaign, like focusing on the narrative, is that it kind of had to be this more meta story. So normally in a campaign for these sorts of things, like you collect your war band or your gang or whatever, your team, and you play and you gain some experience and maybe they get some, buy some better weapons and your guys get better shot or, you know, they get a skill and they can do a certain thing and stuff like that, which is cool. You know, that's fun. But that's absolutely not what happens in the strip. Unless you go back to Portrait of a Mutant when Johnny's a kid, 
Johnny Alpha is already a badass gunslinging gunfighter, you know, bounty hunter from the start. Mm -hmm. Or, as kind of says in the book, you know, Bin Face McNulty doesn't start toting around a blazooka because he rolled it on a table somewhere. You know, he has the same weapons, you know, because they're established narrative characters, really. So it had to work a different way. It had to be about the story, really, of these gangs, uh, these bands kind of fighting and, and doing jobs. And, and essentially, the idea is, you know, because they're not fighting for territory, they're not fighting for, you know, revenge or generally... Um, and stuff like that. They're fighting for creds. And that, that was made, again, that was the thing. It's like these are kind of fairly mercenary groups as much as they might end up being accidental heroes and anti-heroes and stuff. So it was all about the creds, really. And can you amass enough for a nice retirement? Or, you know, you, you go off-world and you're going to live in happiness in a villa somewhere or a shack, as Johnny and Wolf ended up doing. Well, because actually one of the things is, of course, they never actually ended up with any money because Johnny always ends up giving it away to orphans or spending it on time bombs or whatever. He should be like a billionaire, the amount of successful jobs he's done, but he never actually ends up with any money. Yeah. One, because, of course, that just ends the strip. But two, because, you know, that's part of his character, actually. He's not really in it for the money. Um, he just likes to pretend he is, whereas Wolf is. Wolf is much more mercenary yeah. than he is. So... You know, the killing alone, they should have been able to like at least clear their costs and then buy themselves a spaceship. So that's very much it. It's, it's that idea of balancing the books almost of like uh, of growing the assets around the boundless leader who's kind of got together with a few like minded individuals, either one side of the law or the other. Um, and is going to make some bank and retire basically uh, on the, the proceeds of that. And then essentially, you know, but the real story, the real journey was the, you know, the enemies we made along the way. So for a campaign system that's quite different and required some some very different thinking about what progress meant what the proceeds of victory were and the difference between uh, and how recruiting worked when you've got you know you've got very set normally and again in the, like if i think about blood bowl and come under the games like that is you know most stuff is actually your creation and you might have one or two named characters from the ip you know like a special player you know or something like that whereas actually this is almost the opposite the, the chances are most of your band are going to be characters whose equipment and personality and skills and stuff are already very well established in the in the strips. And then you might have one or two that you've invented yourself or some wasters or some uh, goons and stuff like that on the side. So that's a very different dynamic for a campaign for mo than most kind of miniatures campaigns. So it was it was a case of like, again, story first, I suppose, is what, what made that different. And that story being making money, making money, spending money, trying to trying to come out on top after each game. And also things like in the injuries, as, again, as it says in the book, in the injuries thing, it's like, well, characters only get seriously hurt and, 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 and or killed when it's narratively useful. Um, and it was a similar kind of situation. Because one of the other things we wanted to do as well is allow people to use our minis miniatures collection. So like we said earlier, you, know, you can combine the models in any way you want. You can pretend they're from alternative dimensions or shapeshifters or whatever. You know, you can all have Johnny and Wolf if you really wanted to. But only one of them is the real Johnny and Wolf, which is obviously the one that you've got, whoever you happen to be, or stuff like that, to be very flexible about it, not be restrictive at all about people's miniatures collections so they can add models in and change kind of like, um, change that, like, as you said, they can add people to their warband and things as they're going along. Uh, but also at the same point, it's like, you don't want to get Johnny killed in the first game. And you're like, oh, so I don't get to use Johnny for the rest of the campaign. Well, that's not much fun. Just because I happen to roll, you know, a double one on 2d6 or something. So again, characters always survive and it's just about the story or the scrapes or how long they're in a bit of a state after that and you can leave them out of your warband to kind of recover or they're essentially they're wounded and then again that adds part of the narrative you go actually oh uh, johnny's still coming back to the thing but he's actually not quite 100 percent, so he's going to be vulnerable so actually if you're going to go for him now's a really good time to try and take him out or whatever it might be because those are the things that happen in the strip johnny doesn't get killed in the strip you know wolf does eventually sorry spoilers but that becomes a thing you know, that's a, and as, as I said, we've got a whole section on extra narrative. If you really want to get into that, you know, people can, you can just play games and just make up stories in between, you know. All of this is sort of kind of a structure for people playing either pickup games or uh, an organized campaign, you know, like a store or a club or something like that. But, you know, if you really want to, you can just throw all that out of the window and just use the system to fight out whatever you want to come up with for that storyline, whatever your imagination, you know, you can just fight a battle, see what happens and then decide what happens next and fight that game and then see what happens next and, and so on. It's uh, flexible enough to do that. Yeah. One of the things, obviously, you were saying about adding characters to the band and obviously I'd mentioned about the Outlaw Strip where that seemed to kind of happen with the Johnny's band kind of grew and grew. Was that partly inspired by that and the likes of Portrait of a Mutant, a Mutant as well where Johnny has, he seems to kind of have extra allies. Was that part of the thinking behind the campaign system as well? 
Yes, yeah, definitely. It's it's a thing. And also, you know, yeah. And again, allowing people to have more flexibility about which models they use. So you might not, you know, you might add models, but not necessarily take them in every, you might have like eight models in your band, but you might only ever be using four at a time if you really want to, because some are injured or whatever, and you get that flexibility then and get to play differently. Um, but yeah, the idea also of just like recruiting more guys, you know, Bubba's sort of gang slowly expanding or, you know, other people joining together more and more sticks showing up or whatever it might be you know going from a sticks to the sticks brothers to there's a planet of sticks what yeah you know a whole set of sticks kind of thing is quite fun and that's yeah that's something that happens in the story they gain allies because they do other stuff you know journey to hell that kind of stuff mm-hmm. again it's, it's various other people they sometimes they gain allies but also they end up fighting various different enemies essentially in the light of a campaign they potentially would be within one band but you don't necessarily fielding them all at the same time and it, it does come down to like the number of players the stuff you've got you know again we wanted to make sure there was always variety so it doesn't matter who else you're playing in the campaign it feels like there's something it's adding something to the whole narrative yeah definitely and continuing on the, the theme of flexibility one of the things i thought was really good and interesting about it was for the campaign that you can do a really short campaign that only last a few sessions big with you know a real sprawling campaign that could be played against weeks or you know more likely months to be honest i was curious to know about your own personal preference for campaigns do you prefer do you veer towards a shorter one or out for the full out epic i think i'd tend towards shorter a shorter burn thing if only because i think they're less likely to run out of steam i mean that was one of the very definite things was like there was an end to the campaign it is it wasn't just a there was an end point at which point you could say that your band had succeeded in their goal and had enough money and could retire and so, and where you set that line, obviously, kind of um, influences how long the campaign is going to be. But you know, something if you're you know if you're aiming for a campaign to last six months, and after three months, actually, people are starting to go, well, "This is really cool." You know, still having fun, but actually, you know, they've started playing other games, and they're not quite getting as many games in, and you, you know that it's trying to have dragged on a bit too far. So, I think it's much better to kind of aim fairly short. You know, say maybe, "Well, we're going to do two month campaign for two months." Uh, depending on how often you get together, obviously nobody's doing a lot yeah. at the moment. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's like if you've got a fairly regular group and you're playing every week, then you go, "That's cool. You can do a campaign, you know, over two months." Yeah. And you've got like eight games in, and that's going to be quite fun. Or three months. And if some of you, you know, it's like if you're playing at friends' houses, because you know, mm-hmm. of course, if you're at a club, you can actually swap. You know, so there might be four or five of you there, and you can two or three of you can you can have a couple of games going, but then get a couple of games in an evening because it doesn't take that long to play necessarily once you know what you're doing. Yeah. So you could actually, the number of games isn't necessarily just the number of times you can get together, but actually the number of games you can get in it can be quite high. I think, you know, to say you get some of the fun stuff, because you want to be, you know, I think somewhere between a sprint and a, a slightly longer, it's not a marathon. I don't think if you play too long, I think, like I say, it starts to become just socially, you know, it's like, okay, we're gonna, how are we going to organize this? Are we getting together and all the rest of it? So yeah, I, I would I would top out a campaign probably at three months, depending on how often you play. I probably wouldn't aim because it's like if you have fun and you want to carry on, you just start another campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As opposed to if you're not having fun, obviously you'd be having fun. It's a brilliant game, but yeah, you know what I mean. It's like <laughs> play if you want a break. Uh, let's be honest, you might want to. Then you can do that rather than feeling you know if people are starting to feel obliged that they've got to turn up. It's like role playing games and things like that. So it's great to go on now, but it's nice to have might even plan in a mid-season break you know it's like mm. actually we're going to play for three months and this is going to be but actually and then we're going to take a month off and we're going to play some stuff and do whatever else and then we're going to have another three months you know second part of the season there's lots of different ways you can do it but uh, yeah my experience and inclination is always aim smaller and then you can always add on whereas you can't go the other way so it's like oh actually wow bob's won within four weeks because he did got those two really fantastic jobs you go okay cool well we'll up the bar then and we'll keep going you know actually retirement is at you know one and a half million credits not a million credits or whatever it might be and i think that's the thing as well is you want a bit of space for people to play around because the idea is that you know you're kind of you're having to balance that long term versus short term in the campaign of like short term you just want to try and put everything into your savings and just try and hit that victory goal really hmm. but if you do too much of that then you're going to start losing on the tabletop because you've not invested in characters and guys are getting wounded and you know that kind of stuff so then you start thinking well i need to get a saw bones or i need to get an armory to uh, i need to be winning more and hopefully all those things kind of balance out a little bit you know the financial management which is what it comes down to a lot of it uh, then starts to kick in 
but that's a strategy. So as well as tactics on tabletop, you might have a campaign strategy of like, I'm going to hit the ground hard and try and save as hard as I can and try and win before everyone, anyone else catches me up. But of course, then you might start running into trouble and you, you know find yourself not having enough collateral from game to game and stuff like that. So uh, it's another way of another narrative, I suppose, that you get to impose on the game. So you don't want it too short. You know, it's like, oh yeah, we're just going to have four games. You go, well, that's probably not enough for that to quite develop because everyone's just going to be sprinting. Whereas actually, if it's like, yeah, we're going to have like eight games, 10 games, something like that, 12 games, or you're hoping to kind of aim around about that level, then it gives you time to start people to start thinking, okay, it's worth investing in some of these longer term things in the campaign. And also think when you were talking there about the options that you've got in the campaign, you can do things like hire specialists to help you, or you can upgrade your band's layer, which is kind of handy because sometimes your, your layer can come under attack. Yeah. And, and I, I was imagining that you probably had a whole host of possibilities swirling your head for all these different things that you could do for the campaign. I was wondering, did you have any problems narrowing that selection down? Yes, I, w- I wanted to make sure each thing had a kind of very specific role, I suppose. So there's, I remember years ago, working with Jervis Johnson at GW and he, uh, he made a very good point on games design about making significant decisions and obviously people's value of significant can vary depending on the game and things like that but it, I wanted stuff that was going to be a decision that's like it's a chunk of your money and your future prosperity in, in theory to, to upgrade a thing to invest in a specialist uh, which meant that basically they had to be fairly important and have I suppose there was, there was only so many ways that I could monkey with the rules kind of work quite well with the mechanics and the systems we've already got. Mm. But also, they'd, maybe some of them had been in the scenarios, but were just too complicated for a scenario. But actually, they shouldn't. Um, in the rules and things as well, where you go, actually, that, that scenario has gone over a page of rules now. That's probably a bit too much. Because in the strips, again, that aren't necessarily there all the time. The strontium dogs and things sometimes have to, you know, they have to make a base somewhere or they have a hideout. Or they've got the doghouse itself. It's mm-hmm. The resources they've got, backing them up from the, any local authorities, stuff like that. Again, as with the chicanery and things, it's like there's probably stuff, if I was to read reading this story again, actually that's like so obviously a layer upgrade or whatever it might be that I, I kind of missed. But because I think we went through fairly stringently at the start and tried to just... Most of the stuff that we thought was a cool thing ended up being in there somewhere as either an ability, you know, a character's ability or an armory card or a chicanery card or in a scenario or whatever. So hopefully we got pretty much everything covered. And I think certainly in terms of things you'd want to do with your gang, in terms of like patching them up or equipping them or defending them or all that kind of stuff is is covered as well. And and also things that make a good story. So, you know, being able to actually, the idea of like running a pub kind of thing of which kind of attracts more low life to you and makes it like easier to you know having a cantina uh, you know Moss Eisley style to attract ne'er do wells and things like that it's quite fun you know and that's different to the people that have kind of invested in a weapons cache and stables or whatever so the lair and the people around you become part of your band's character as much as the models in it I hope, hopefully yeah it's got its own personality as well yeah kind of narrative again behind it. One of the other aspects is the deed system, which I thought was really inspired as you gain bonus rerolls as your experience as a bounty hunter grows, but at the same time, your notoriety and value to enemies increases, which basically means that your experienced characters become even more prime targets for enemy bands. And I thought that was really clever because it works from a narrative standpoint, but it also addresses a problem which I've noticed with some other campaign systems and other games, where if one side's doing better than the other, overall you get this kind of power creep basically where one side then really dominates the campaign i was wondering if that notoriety and increase in bounty was a kind of helpful mechanic that was flavorful to the setting but i was wondering if it was intended to mitigate some of that kind of power creep and imbalance that can develop in a campaign yeah there were a couple of reasons for it really i say yeah there were three things that it was intended to do one of which was slightly address that idea of gangers ganging gaining experience and getting a bit better. Like I say, we didn't want to change their stats necessarily or give them different equipment. Where re-roll is a nice, easy one of just like making somebody a bit better. And then, and your leader in particular, again, can use it in slightly different situations. So you end up being able to manipulate the scenarios or the payoff or whatever it might be in slightly different ways. So that, that was quite interesting uh, and did allow characters to develop themselves without massively changing who they are. Mm-hmm. They just got better. Like I said, better at what they already do as opposed to doing more things. But without... Uh, you know, re-roll is just a nice, easy way of doing that. The second one, like I say, was as a kind of an un- that kind of idea of an underdog bonus. The fact that you might end up taking on a gang with a high notoriety. There's already a mechanism in a basic game, even. You know, one of the things we haven't really talked about is the fact that you don't even have to agree 
necessarily at a, a notoriety level. You can just choose which models you want. That's true. And then essentially, if somebody's overspent by loads compared to the other person, then they get chicanery cards to kind of even the odds a bit. Yeah. But also the idea that actually if if you decide to kind of take on a band that's got much more experience and notoriety than you, taking out people is worth more. So actually, uh, and, and more conversely, it's not worth the big guys continue picking on the little guys. I suppose that's the thing. Because normally it's like, oh, I get, you know, I get five experience points for taking out a character. Uh, and it doesn't make any difference whether the, that's a starting band or your closest rival. Whereas actually the third reason was that it accelerates the campaign. Because mm-hmm. as everybody rises up, everyone starts earning more for bounties because the people they're taking out are worth more and things like that. But then they also cost more to get patched up because that's based on your notoriety as well and things like that. So actually it stops the campaign becoming a grind because if everyone's still only worth like, 23,000 creds or whatever their notoriety is you know, at the end of the campaign. It's going to take a long time. But one of the things you notice in the strip is they get big scores sometimes. That was the thing is it kind of came from the strip almost of like, I could never, I went through and I tried to work out, you know, what's the average bounty and stuff. And there isn't one because essentially Alan Magnum or whatever just made up, John Magnum just made up values off the top of his head. And they're not always in creds and all that kind of stuff. So I couldn't really work out what bounty levels you know an average bounty where sometimes like aha yeah here's two outlaws that nobody's heard of and it's sixty thousand creds and then uh, another time it's like half a million creds on this and so i wanted wanted to be people to be able to be very valuable you know it's like if you're doing really well with bubba and he's worth a million and a half creds or whatever it's like that's really important but if you can take him down Mm -hmm. and it's part of that meta campaign i suppose it's a simple mechanic, but actually the players talking amongst themselves and the psychology of the players is like, actually, I want to go and pick a fight with them because I want to try and take him down and I want a piece of that bounty. But I know they're really hard because <laughs> you know, that bounty is there for a reason because he's actually he's done 18 deeds and that's no small feat, you know. So, yeah, so that was the three things, really. Yeah, of just like a very simple experience system, a bit of an underdog system, but also just a way of reflecting the different bounties in the strip and ensuring that the people in the campaign kind of accelerate towards the end and get more stuff and can buy more and save more, I suppose, as you play more. Yeah. I, I hadn't actually thought of that, but the rise in bounty on them, um, yeah, it works really well. <laughs> when you explain it, it seems so obvious now that you've said it, but I hadn't really thought of it. Well, in a way, that's good, because you haven't noticed it, but it's been there, <laughs> you know, as opposed to it being kind of like slapping you in the face of like this. So, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> And the other thing that's in it is the uh, grudges. That's the kind of final flourisher campaign system, which is, for anybody that doesn't know, a band that isn't really performing well or racking up many deeds. The grudge points help build like a resentment and rivalry between bands. And again, kind of following up what we're saying in the actual built in gameplay, but there's sometimes unexpected and flavorful bonuses. And I just love that idea that kind of simmering fury. <laughs> if you've, you've been you're taking a beat yeah. to benefit you, yeah, I thought that was great. Yeah, again, it was another thing that's in the strip, you know, Mm. we keep talking about rage, you know, that's the ultimate grudge. But also what spurs that, which is, of course, Bubba's grudge against Johnny and Alpha for them foiling all these kind of, his time travel robbery type stuff, or actually trying to destroy the future world of norms, isn't he? I think it's it's his mad gold in the end. So that was something from the strips that I wanted to include, this idea of this building a grudge. And but also just another mechanism for keeping the campaign interesting and given, uh, like I said, there were there were certain things and mechanics or interesting bits that were like, were in the game but were kind of in the wrong place. And actually, the grudge abilities, you know, and the idea of it letting it, you can either let it off early and kind of get a, a smaller bonus, or you can just let it build and build and like, let that wound fester and fester <laughs> until you, you know, if you get it up to like I think is it fifty or something like that, grudges against a particular band, and you just say you can just do the hit, you can do the Papa ambushes Johnny and Wolf in their retirement shack scenario, basically because you're just that mad for revenge now, uh, and and also it gives you another level to who you're, you know, it's like if you've got three or four players in a campaign actually changing the games and the dynamics between you so that actually the games at the end of the campaign aren't like, even if you have not really changed that much at all the few little things that have the few things like the grudges and the deeds and stuff just mean that those games at the end aren't going to play the same way as the games at the start without necessarily changing a single model even in your warband the rules around them have changed so and the idea that you're deliberately going after the same big slightly maybe slightly more powerful warband in hope of building up grudge against them is a thing <laughs> you know hoping that you don't maybe you don't you're not paying too much in injury bills and you've invested in a sore bones or whatever to help with that uh, and then you just keep banging your head against the big guy until you get what you want and then you're going to pay it all off in one big uh, you know 
because uh, because they're you know you're going to get that bounty from them using your grudges as well is a good way of like say even if somebody looks like they're racing ahead and they've won quite a few games there's a lot of checks and balances in the campaign system and again grudges are one of those mm-hmm. just do it in a fun way i think oh absolutely i thought the campaign system was really brilliant you know as i say i felt like every aspect that kind of ticked every box that i was looking for as a fan of the strip and certainly the campaign again just added another layer of all this kind of unpredictability and backstabbing and, and so on those kind of aspects which are the things that make the strip what it is you know so i suppose um just getting back to the kind of general set then one of the things that kind of struck me about the starter set was how beautifully presented the rule books were which had a great mix of the game photos and images from the strip i'm guessing obviously as a fan yourself it must have been a bit of a thrill scene as queer as artwork used to such effect to illustrate and complement your rules yes yeah i mean it's a it's just a nice looking book I don't know, because he's got such a style. It just holds together nicely anyway, just by featuring his art. And there's a nice contrast, actually, because, of course, a lot of the really old art is black and white and things, and we see a lot of full-colour books. And there is some colour in there and photos and all sorts of stuff. But actually, there's something nice and old school about black and white illustration as well. Yeah. There's kind of a nod back to that. And as we've just discussed before, the cards, you know, that's one of the, the jobs we did is we went through and... Like I say, some of them we already had panels that we wanted to use because they had been the inspiration and the other ones that had come about because it was kind of a cool mechanic or it was a sort of a thing that we thought should be in there. One of the last things we did was go through and pick out particular illustrations or sequences either for the cards or for particular spreads mm-hmm. on the book and stuff like that and say, oh, actually, this panel here on, you know, from Prog whatever story is a really good one to illustrate the subdued rule or whatever. I don't know, I'm making that up. But do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. actually put in particular panels close in particular rule sections was kind of part of some of our thinking because it, it's like, well, this is the part of the story that inspired us to put this kind of thing in the game. Yeah. Um, and obviously, again, having just like character illustrations and things already made it nice. The one I'm looking up here is, is Showdown, actually. Mm-hmm. And it's just got a picture and it's like, it's just Johnny's legs, but it's got him going, Goober. You know, it's kind of the step outside and there's him going, oh, snack. <laughs> And it's just, you know, it's like that's that story is why there's a showdown scenario or you know, showdown job in there. The bushwhack one is like, you know, is Johnny Wolf and Middenface when they're kind of like they're basically being they're pinned down by the howlers. I think that's in the uh, when they go out to clear out, was it Precinct 49 or something? It's, it's, it's Amnesty Ends and it's just like dozens of bounty hunters all kind of converge to see how much they can get. Um, so, yeah, using the art as part of the narrative, I suppose, which is what has happened in the strips, but actually making those connections for people. But also, yeah, it's like, this is what inspired us to make these parts of this game. It, it carries all the way through in the presentation as well. And obviously another huge part of the miniatures game is, are the miniatures themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So which were your, your personal favourites? Uh, I'd say the sticks, actually. I really like the sticks, just because I like them anyway. I say we've kind of discussed them a bit. I think we've obviously got that in common. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the nice the thing is, of course, actually, I don't know how it is for the miniature designer, really, but obviously it's a bit of an easy job, really, that one, because they all look the same. So it's just like, it's basically one miniature, like, posed three different ways, and they never do anything. They're never leaping about or doing anything difficult to pose and stuff. They just, But they carry that gravitas and that kind of that feel it's just there in the solidity and actually the rigidness of the miniatures, which in some cases wouldn't work. For the, the sticks works really well. Mm-hmm. And as a, as a surprise vote, perhaps, not because they're not, they're not good, but um, I really like the wasters, actually. Yeah. Like there's just kind of three random wasters, but they're, they're particularly good, I think, because they're not necessarily a specific Esquera design, not necessarily, but they feel like they are. And they've just got the elements, and the three are very different, but also just got those common common elements that Esquire would have put on them with like the pads and the style and things like that. So from like very iconic sticks figure to actually almost generic, but actually still very distinctive kind of like uh, like a waster. They're there as chaff really in your band. They get used, they're extras essentially in the story, but actually still just as characterful as the big named characters. Yeah. Uh, so that's, yeah, I really like them as well. Although I, I thought they were actually based on the panel we were mentioning about Gibber. Well, I think they say, yeah, it's that good that like, I plucked out background characters, like you say, which work, that choice works really well, even though we never necessarily know exactly who they are. And things. Yeah. So it would have been easy just to, to design some kind of generic sci fi Western type characters, not, but going that, 
you know, going back to the source material and using it even on like the lowest level guys. And the same with the Builder Muti, similar sort of thing of like, there's obviously just trying to get that Esquera style, like we said, not kind of dramatic, just kind of slightly ludicrous in many situations, painful deformity kind of mutations and combining them together in different ways is, is very effective. And, and again, it, it's very much in the style of the strip. And I, I agree with you about the sticks. I loved it. As somebody that's much more about the playing of games and less involved in the I find it relaxing sometimes to do the painting. More it's a case more it's a case of I want to get them painted so I can get on with the game. That's that's how I come at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I love the sticks as well. I've got two sets of sticks and um part of the reason I got two was because um well one of those characters you know that there's a huge clan of eventually you kinda of realise that there's 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 loads of them. Yeah. But also because when I first started out with Strontium Dog it was the quality comics, which is a, a bit of a <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the, and the sticks were in red duster coats and that. So that was right. my first experience of the sticks. And then <laughs> subsequently I found out it was like the, more like the kind of cream. Yeah, that very like more traditional kind of like, yeah. So I've got, a, I've got one set that's red and one set that's kind of cream so that cool. I, I can do that kind of thing. Sometimes it's, the red guys are the ones that usually team up with the outlaws and the, and the other ones are the... Uh, right, that's cool. Yeah, I like those ones <laughs> as well for the same reason. Because <laughs> I'm very lazy with paint. <laughs> that's just my big coat hat. That's pretty much done. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, I was also wondering, obviously, you know, you've got a long career in gaming and you're well used to releasing games, but I was wondering if the fact that you were adapting a well-loved 2000 AD strip into a game brought any additional pressures? Did you feel that, you know, fandom were going to be looking over your shoulders as to what you were doing? Which we were, obviously, in fairness. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose so. But I think I, I didn't feel this pressure because I think, both Andy and I, the pressure's just kind of internal anyway, particularly as fans, but also just wanting to do a good job, whatever it is. But also, in some ways, the material and stuff we knew was so rich, mm. I suppose. So it wasn't necessarily the fans, but the material that we wanted to do right by it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, like I said, there's a lot of legacy there. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be happy with ourselves, I guess. You know, fans can be slightly, fandoms can be uh, slightly contradictory in what they like and all the rest of it stuff. So, you know, it wasn't like we want to hit these particular things because it'll please the players. It's like, no, we want to hit these because this is what it's about. This is what's right about it. This is why people like it and why we like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and essentially, like I say, start off by designing a game that we wanted to play and that we enjoyed playing and gave us the sort of feels that we wanted to have playing a Strontium Dog game. And then hopefully, hopefully that would be translated into other fans. And because we approached it from that way, I suppose it wasn't, it didn't really feel like that pressure. It felt like an opportunity mm-hmm. to do that. To do, uh, it's like, well, I'm so glad we've been given this opportunity to do this because it'd really bug me if somebody else was doing it and they didn't do it right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, yeah. And they could approach it in a very different way. So, yeah, it was. It was definitely, and I think because of the two of us doing it together and, and we work well together and, and, and kind of know each other's strengths and weaknesses and where we kind of complement each other and stuff like that, the pressure was off a little bit for that as well because sometimes, you know, as a game designer, particularly freelance, you know, it's just you. And then obviously you get people to play test and stuff, but actually this is very much a two brains we're better than one because we just look at different things and see different things uh, and play differently and stuff like that. So actually that meant that, you know, if I was trying to design this on my own, like just the, some of the crunchier end of stuff and trying to just like design all those characters and stat lines and things like that, I'd do it. But actually my strengths, my best areas are actually, you know, is in the narrative and is in kind of like the, the slightly more the development side of stuff. Whereas Andy's like hot on the design and, and that basic system and getting that to work and then having somebody like me monkey around with it uh, and in different ways, but also just deconstructing story and all that kind of stuff. So it didn't feel like, oh, you know, like if people, well, one, because we were just pleased with it. So we didn't, it wasn't a case of like, oh, what if people hate this? But also it's like, no, we really enjoy this. So I think people are going to really enjoy it as well. Yeah. And I think, I think they have. And certainly more experience, I just think it's, I don't really know what else you could have done with it, to be honest, because it feels to me as if everything's in there that a fan of the strip would want to see. Yeah. I mean, that certainly seems to be the way, you know, it's like the interactions we've had. There's always bits. There's you know, just like technicalities and all that kind of stuff. And you can always tidy up stuff, and you think, "Oh, I, I'd do that slightly differently and stuff." But I think the discussion around it, and you know, just even talk, you know, talking to you and and like the, the involvement you have with various groups and and stuff like that, is that it's hit the notes we wanted it to hit. You know, like the the responses are the ones that we had 
rather than it's not like we haven't created a scene and suddenly it's been treated very differently. It's like, no, people have got it. We've managed to communicate what we wanted to communicate, I suppose, as a game and as an ethos for the game. And everyone seems to agree that's a cool one. And, and like I say, even like, and even if there are like very hardcore players who are trying to like really grind the system and do that and stuff, it's like, it's still robust enough to, to handle most of that as well, you know, and the rest of it's just like, well, any other game system's going to crack under that kind of pressure, you know, <laughs> but similarly make sure that actually the people that are just there for the fun and rolling toy soldiers and having a drink and pushing, uh, oh, sorry, rolling toy, pushing toy soldiers and rolling dice, don't want to roll your toy soldiers. Um, uh, you know, they can do it as well. It's not, you know, it's a very approachable system. It's, you know, it's good fun. So it's got those layers to it. And I think and people seem to have responded very well to that. And part of that's just kind of clear communication in the book itself about what we're trying to do. People understand what we're doing, why the game is the way it is. And when you do that, you've answered half the questions anyway. So because a lot of feedback slash criticism slash opinion about games and things isn't necessarily about, oh, well, actually this thing isn't balanced or this thing doesn't work. It's a case of like, well, I see these as being more of a strength three than a strength four type of thing. And it's, it's kind of more, especially when it's informed of an IP. And I think we've hit the net, we know, because we've managed to convey a lot of that character and the individuals and, and stuff. There doesn't seem to be a lot of that. Well, I think that's what's most pleasing is people seem to like our interpretation of it, I suppose. As much as the nuts and bolts of how the game works and everything else, people like our version of Strontium Dog, the universe and the characters and how they act. Oh, definitely. I suppose one final question would be, in the months that followed the release of Strunt and Dog, all the characters in the, featured in the core rulebook were soon released, but so too were additional characters like the Krailers and the Mutant Army Generals. I was wondering if there was any personal favourites of your own that haven't yet made it to the tabletop that you'd still like to see added to the game? Well, the, the thing, sort of going back right to the start, because the thing, and we talked about this and we made sure it's kind of possible in the game, that I'd really... I would like to do, I suppose, if I if it's like if, you were to, if I was to add something to it, is I'd really like to do the killing, and, and it could be quite as easy as just adding in some of those characters. So you've got like vicious, malicious, the thing. We've already got Steel Krieg. There's uh, the dirty clones, and of course the Osmongs. <laughs> it's not again. You know, both of those are nice, easy ones for a miniatures design. It's like, well, just get it right once and then just change the poses. And, and that'd be cool because you could do that. But actually, I like the idea because that was one of my first big memories of Strongy Dog is the killing. You know, I remember that more than the Moses incident, even though I read the Moses incident first looking back. So, and it must have worked because it summed up, it sums up, you know, as much as any of the other stories as an introduction, it just summed up Johnny and Wolf brilliantly, which is like they're there and they're bounty hunters and they're killing people. And it's all a bit, you know, it's like this is quite anti hero stuff and things. But actually, there's a couple of times where they, you know, it's like he's not worth anything. He's, what are you doing here? The guy is going to get gutted and they let, you know, they, sh- they shoot the thing and they let the guy go free and he gets blown up by somebody else later, obviously. But it's like they're just there to, to make the play on the words, they're there to make a killing in a different way. Uh, and the cleverness at the end, using the time bomb to escape as well, is because he's like, "Oh, how are you going to get out of this?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, well, Johnny's already thought of this." Kind of, <laughs> uh, you know, he throws the time. He's like, "He's not used the time bomb. It's the uh, Chekhov's time bomb almost." You know, he's got it there right at the start and never uses it, it's the kind of thing, because actually it's part of their escape plan. Yeah. So it's all there, and actually it'd be quite nice. And you could recreate it, and I think you know, like because because quite a few of the cards, the, particularly again the chicanery cards, are inspired by moments in the killing and things like that. Rather than, you know, just kind of getting stuff at random, what you do is you just sign armory cards and you'd sign chicanery cards. Um, but it'd be, it'd be a big, big multiplayer type thing, I think, you know. Mm. You'd want to have three, four, five players kind of thing. And that would need some monkeying with the, the system, really. You just need some different kind of chips, really, as it comes down to it. But there's also, I think there'd be one or two other bits that we'd want to tweak for a kind of very multiplayer game. So that'd be really cool. You know, I think that seems to me as a nice bunch of characters that haven't been very explored because they only appear in that one ship. But they still have that kind of that classic kind of Esquera design and, you know, they've got enough of a personality even in the short appearances yeah. like Steel Creek has that you can create a, a little story and you can create a little rule set around them. Yeah, I have played like a, a I think I've played four players uh, for Strontium Dog before. Yeah. So I do think it's definitely doable. And yeah, I'll maybe do that then in a video at some point. I'll try and try and <laughs> run the kill in a four player game. That would be that would be good fun. That would be cool, yes. Yeah. If we can just get this over this pandemic and get back to some well, yeah. proper gaming. <laughs> that would be nice. Yes, it'd be nice. Nearly there. Nearly, hopefully. That's it. There's a way out now. So it's cool. Yes, yes. I think that's that's the thing of like uh one of the things doing the um doing the starts at the the good the bad and the muti which was about you know in those that was where 
it was kind of off the peg scenarios and stuff. Everything that's in there is actually from the scenarios and from the chicanery and stuff like that. But we've pre chosen it. And that was one of the things that actually was quite interesting. And like I say, we've kind of done work with that a bit further. And I think there's some cool stuff you can do about actually creating more narratives just by selecting, like saying actually, oh, you've got this, this, and this chicanery card to start with, rather than it being random, uh, you know, and actually this guy's got this armory card already and then the other two are random, stuff like that, you can actually create fairly bespoke scenarios quite easily. Mm-hmm. So that's something we could, you know, it would be fun to do more of as well. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to see if there was any more things like that. That would be good fun. So, yeah, I think that pretty much, I've exhausted all my questions here. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming on to talk about it. I think that was a great conversation. I really enjoyed listening to it. I hope everybody else that's uh, listening in did as well. And yeah, as a fan, I want to thank you for what yourself and Andy have, have done, both in engaging and in, in talking to fans like myself on a podcast like this, but also, you know, just for, you know, what you have delivered. Because it's, uh, as I say, it feels like Strawberry and Dog to me all the way through it, all the kind of different aspects of the game. So it was a real joy to play, actually. So thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for playing it and being a, such a fan. And, uh, and, you know, you've been a, quite a champion in the community for it and stuff like that as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Uh, happy bringing back uh, happy memories of Strontium and Dog and working with Andy and everything. So uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And it was an absolute pleasure to talk to Gav. I want to offer a massive thank you again to both Gav and Andy for being so kind and generous with their time in coming on to chat about their work in the system. I hope that these discussions have given you some insight into the process of creating these games and that if you've been thinking of trying out Strontium Dog that they may persuade you to give it a go. If you're still undecided please keep an eye on the Life of Die YouTube channel as I'm working on a how to play video. Also planned are Strontium Dog podcasts where I'll be joined by fellow gaming fanatic and Strontium Dog aficionado Alan Stenhouse. We'll be providing some game tips and analysing the various characters and bands available to play in the game. Most exciting of all though, Alan is planning on running a campaign of the killing with all 100 contestants and will be documenting it for the community. So to make sure you don't miss out, please hit the subscribe button on my YouTube channel. But until then, keep on living the life of die.